says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Okay? Our struggle isn't with the ordinary person. It isn't with your neighbor. It isn't with anyone else here in the church. If you feel your blood pressure going up a little bit towards somebody in church, rebuke that. Because that is not of God. But what is it against? It's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. What he's saying is, the apostles emphasizing that your struggle isn't with the people who are maybe part of this movement, they don't know any better. They're just like you. They're not privy to everything. It's you got to move up and see the sinister motives behind those who are in power, those who are pushing the movements, and then you'll see it more clearly. That's where the struggle is. And even though the devil's behind it all, Satan does use rulers, political powers, and world forces of evil to carry out his evil against the populace, specifically the people of God. We demonstrated in part one of the series that there have been many governments that have been in the toolbox of Satan over the years. Presently, he's using Marxism in governments to accomplish his will. Now, what is this Marxism in review? Very simple. The economic theory of Karl Marx, a godless German philosopher 150 years ago, centered on condemnation of capitalism. He didn't like capitalism. Capitalism, what we have here, is just a type of economic governmental force that we use. That's all. We're not always going to have it. We might have it. It could be replaced by a thousand different things. It doesn't mean God's not still on the throne. Okay? Marx taught that in a capitalistic system, there's a bishwazi, that's the rich elite, the Mark Bezos of the world, the rich elite people who usually smoked pipes and spoke with a British accent. Fancy, fancy. Okay? They would eventually, this is a theory, by the way, they would eventually be overcome by the proletariat, which is the working class, the working Joe, guy who drinks Folgers, not Starbucks. Okay? His theory taught there would be, there would then be a transition from socialism to revolutionary co communism. This is, in essence, in one picture, what his theory taught. Capitalist, bad, condemn it. It's going to transition to socialism on its way to communism, and then finally we'll all be able to join hands and sing, I'd like to buy the world a Coke because we will have utopia. The common tendency is anti religion, anti family, anti blessing perspectives. That's the telltale signs. You know, if you smell, you ever notice you go into a neighborhood and you smell barbecue? I love that smell. I wish they made like, 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 like a, an aftershave called like, like to toasted mammal or something. I'd buy that stuff. It's great, man. You're not even hungry and your stomach growls when you smell barbecue. But you know, when you smell barbecue, you kind of know what's behind that. If you smell anti-religion, anti-family, anti-blessing, don't think of a steak. Think of Marxism because that's exactly what it stands for in the end. This political movement found a natural partner with humanism. Humanism. Making it potentially the most powerful tool ever in Satan's toolbox. What is humanism? It is human-centered philosophy of a complete independence from God, making it possible for man to finally shine on their own, possessing the answers to all the world's problems and being able to work towards utopia. 
That's what it is. Because if there's no God, then you get to Psalm 82, 6. Have you not said we are gods? Somebody's going to be God. Somebody is. Moral authority is going to come from somewhere. And when it comes from the heart of man, that is not good. Because it becomes moral relativism. Humanism has always been around. Now it has the full power of Marxism behind it. It's always been around. In Genesis 3, verse 5, you remember it's the call to become independent from God. Just like the devil said to Eve. Think about what he said. For you know that the day you eat of it, your eyes will surely be open. You shall become like God, knowing good and evil. Woo, that sounds good, man. And she partook and gave it to her husband with her. He wasn't down at Home Depot. He was right there. And he took it, and they were both plunged into sin. That's humanism. Genesis 11, verse 4. You remember when they were building the Tower of Babel? They were building the Tower of Babel. They said, come. 11, verse 4. Let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top reaches into heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. It's about promoting humans. Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. That's humanism. In Daniel 4, 30, I think one of the best examples of humanism is when Nebuchadnezzar stood up, looked over his kingdom, Daniel 4, 30, he said, Is this not Babylon the great which I have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. Yeah, you're a humanist. And God says, uh, time out for a period of seven. And he ended up out at uh, Monson's feeding range. Romans 1, 22 and 23, professing to become wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling things. This all is, is humanism because it pushes the theistic influence out of the equation and then it lets the vacuum of human futility of the mind take over. Now. Humanism has been around as long as humans have been, and it will always be around as long as humans are here. It's the nature of it. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. That's because we're human. It's through the tool of Marxism that humanism is making a full-on assault on society. And that's that itchy feeling you have every time you hear the news and like, what's next? What's this world coming to? Those reading their Bibles, though, if we have been reading our Bibles as faithful Christians, this should not take you by any surprise. Let's go ahead and read the Bible a little bit here. Okay, it's always been around. But now humanism, Satan pulled out and is combining the best of this new government authority and he's powering it and it's splintering so many things apart. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now here's Paul writing to Christians under Roman imperialism and all the Roman gods system in place, the persecutions. He said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. He says, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
forbidding the marrying, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Paul was saying, listen, you think it's bad now? In the latter times, it could get real ugly. You're going to see humanism come back with a vengeance. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Paul wrote Timothy again, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For man will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of ple ple <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, but, but denying the power thereof. Think about that. That is the culture of narcissism that he just described. Look at Second Peter chapter three, three and four. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come a mocking, following their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. They're going to come and they're going to come a mocking. In Jude, verse 17 and 18, even Jude got in the action. He said, But you, beloved, ought to remember that the words which were spoken of by the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. Just follow the lust. You'll always find out what the motive is. Now, nobody can predict the exact time when the end is coming. And if you do, you're wrong. But we do know two things for sure. These are guarantees. Number one, we are 2,000 years closer than when this is written. It doesn't take a Solomon to figure that one out. Number two, it's not going to be a pleasant time to be a person of faith. Okay? So if you're getting an uncomfortable feeling, if you feel like you're being canceled by this secular world that you don't have anything to offer, you need to shed your theistic beliefs and go have a Coke with the world. If that's how you feel, this lesson is for you. Humanism is now being weaponized with the power of Marxism, sending, it out, sending out her secular tentacles. Secular tentacles. Think of the tentacles going out. The devil has two tools in his hand. He has humanism. That one never left. But now he has this handy dandy from KTEL, this new Marxism to push and drive the bits even further. Tentacles of activist groups being endorsed by the rulers and the powers of this world, Ephesians 6.12. And so, They're using a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. They have their own set of morals. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 and 16, He said, Beware of false prophets. Beware of them, which come to you in sheep's clothing. Man, they're looking fine. Mary had a little lamb. Woo! His fleece was white as snow. But in word, they're ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. How did Jesus say we will know them? By their fruits. And fruits come in the form of their actions and of their words. That's how you know what the fruit is. So if you simply go to the leadership, the rulers, the powers, the people who are high up, and look at what they're saying, you can clearly see a direct connection of the humanism-Marxism connection. You're going to see the devil with both. In the same way you can envision a seven-headed 
uh, multi-crowned dragon in Revelation, and you could understand it, it's important to understand what we're really facing because if we do not have the proper perspective, we'll start viewing our fellow man who lives around us like it's them, and they're no different than us. They just don't know. The sinister stuff is high up. So let's go ahead and just look at it. It's going to be a very simple exercise. Jesus said you shall what? Know them by their fruits. Let's see what's growing on the trees high up. I shall give you actual words of people in leadership positions who are high up in organizations that are actually behind these movements. And, and, and there'll be some good and there'll be some bad, but we're going to just judge it by the fruits. You won't know who said it. There are two types of education. One should teach us how to make a living and the other on how to live. Think about all that you know about the Bible, what you know about God. Do you think this is okay? It's okay to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, maybe some history, but you better be learning something to apply to your life. That sounds biblical, doesn't it? Okay. That was written by John Adams, second president of the United States. That's what he was saying about education. Okay. So we judge the fruit, and who's it connected to? Here's another one. Both economic opportunity through the labor movement and an educational opportunity through public education were key for Jews to go from the working class to the ownership class. Those who are in the ownership class now want to take that ladder of opportunity away from those who do not have it. It's totally a privileged argument. Can you see Bishwazi and proletariat in there? Let me, give you, let me give you the background of this statement. It just happened in April of this year. A group of Jewish parents in the Northeast said, listen, our kids haven't been to school for a year. Everything else is going up. People all over the world are going to school. And there's something standing in the way of our kids going back to school. Do you want to know who said this? Randy Weingartner. Randy Weingartner. She is the president of the teachers' union. She's the president of the teachers' union. And she was telling them she viewed everything back through Marxism. And by the way, a special note to this, she is Jewish, so it isn't so much a stab at Judaism, and she's married to a woman rabbi, by the way. But she was chasing a Jewish, Jewish parents who demanded the teachers' union to get back to work and stop sitting at home. Do what you were hired to do. And she pulled Marxists on them. Another education quote, done in 1935, before any of us were born, I think. No? <laughs> okay. 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 This individual said knowledge is humanistic in quality, not because it is about human products in the past, but because of what it does liberating human intelligence and human sympathy. Kind of a lot of focus on human there, isn't it? Do you see it? Doesn't smell like a T-bone. Smells sort of like manure. You know who said that? Ready? John Dewey. Atheist educator John Dewey. One of the biggest names in education from the last century. He was humanist of the year. The first ever humanist of the year. And he loved Marxist teachings. So don't think it's something new. The humanism has always lingered around and it's waiting to get some footing. 
It's been slipping on ice for a long time, but now it's got a full steam ahead. Here's a quote. Okay. Know them by their fruit. Okay. We are in an environmental crisis which threatens the survival of this nation and the world as a suitable place of human habitation. Okay, Chicken Little, let's go. Okay, here's another quote. Population will inevitably and completely outstrip whatever small increases in food supplies we make. The death rate will increase to at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving in the next 10 years. Oh my, this is terrifying. We gotta do something. I control the weather. I control climate. Here's another one. Within 20 years, some 4 billion people, including 65 million Americans, will perish in the great die off related to this very climate concern they have. Now, when you think about this, you don't know who said it, you don't know when it was said, but when you think about it, being a Christian, knowing the biblical perspective that God has the final word and he will melt the earth with fervent heat and the environmentalists don't like that, okay? But when you look at this, this is pretty humanistic, isn't it? we got to do something. Okay, ready? Buckle your pew belts. This was the secular scientist, one of 18 predictions they made on the first Earth Day in 1970. I follow science. Yeah, science is fluid, by the way. People who followed the flat earth theory back before they figured out it was round, the Christians, by the way, because the Bible said so, they were the flat earthers. I follow science. And now, because we don't buy everything, somebody says, because we know science is designed to always test, to always reinforce, to learn more, there's an ancient Chinese proverb which says, beware of the sound of one hand clapping. When you remove opposition in a logical debate, you have now forfeited your right to even make the argument because you say there's no possible way you could be wrong. In other words, you know all there is to know. Since 1970, did you know I left out, I left out, uh, 15 other ones that are just as wacky, that are worse, but they had the years and the quotes, so I didn't want to give it away. 50 years ago, 51 years ago, on the first, first Earth Day, the scientists got together, we gotta save the Earth! We can save the Earth. I have the power. You can't even stop the rain from falling on you. Here's another one. Is this a good or a bad biblical quote? The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. We've got to do it. We have the power. Is this biblical or is it not? It's not. This is very humanistic. I don't care who made this quote, but to me as a Christian man reading the Bible, I got a problem with this. Socialist Congresswoman Andrea Ocasio-Cortez. That was one year ago. We only have 11 more years. It's very sinister. Know them by their fruit. He created them male and female. Huh. Who said that? God in Genesis 12:7. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Two genders? Makes sense to me. Makes sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Thank you, God. Here's another quote. Gender is not as these transphobes would like to claim biologically predetermined. Rather, it is socially constructed. In its modern form, gender functions to maintain a capitalistic system. Uh, let's judge that fruit there for a second. Does it, the, 
Is that digestible in being a Christian? I don't think so. I can't hang on to this and take that. Well, who in the world would say this? Keep in mind you judge the fruit, not the person. See what you just did? Watch this. This is Ezra Brain, a leading trans multidisciplinary activist. How many titles can you have? But this is humanism and Marxism heading up that movement. Here's another one. Have many children and grow in number. Fill the earth, be its master. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I, I can digest that. I mean, the book I read has been telling me that. Makes sense. Here's a quote. Okay? This is from the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Here's what they say now on their own website. Only prejudice allows us to deny other rights that we have expect to have for ourselves, whether it is based on race, gender, sexual orientation, or species. You see, they took religion out of there and they put species in there. They're saying animals, all animals should have the same rights that we have as humans. It's sick, isn't it? It's sinister, and it comes from the higher up. If you ever were even partially pro-PETA, if you only eat vegan, do you have a problem of extending the rights to flies and other critters? We can't even afford us. You'll know them by their fruits. Remember, rulers the leaders, the wickedness in high places. Paul warned about that. Here's one. Judge this. We oppose the rich getting poorer, the poor getting poorer, and are in total opposition to the wars of aggression and imperialism, whoever pursues them. Well, the Bible does say the labor is worthy of their rewards. Okay. I mean... If you work hard, you'll get some blessing, right? Now, we're going to throw that out the window. You might not even know who this guy is. Harry Hay, Marxist founder of the U.S. gay rights movement. An avowed Marxist. An avowed Marxist since 1935. He passed away about 20 years ago. He's a guy who got it kicked off. Before the Stonewall riot, there was Harry Hay. And he was a Marxist, and he taught humanism. But keep in mind, it's not about him personally. It's his fruit. Here's, a, here's one. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That's very biblical, is it not? That's incredible. And you know who said that, don't you? Martin Luther King did. And I'll, I'll tell you this much. I loved him before, but after spending over... 45 hours and two lessons. That man was a genius. And I see, I see why so many people love him so much and wept the day he died. Because he took something so important to us, Christian values, and he tried to change something that needed changing. Here's one. We are trained Marxist. We are super versed on sort of ideological theories and I think that what we really try to do is to build a movement that such could be utilized by many, many black folk. Okay? Compare what you just saw King say and now look at this. Is this good fruit or bad fruit? To me, this is a warning sign. 
Well, okay, why don't we judge the fruit? Who said it? Patrice Cullors, co-founder and former CEO of Black Lives Matter. She said this in 2015 in an interview. She was trained for years in Marxism. Trained for years. In fact, there was a lady sitting next to her who started the chapter in Toronto who became her wife. Are you seeing a pattern? Here's one, maybe this will be a good one. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirements by supporting each other's extended families and villages that will collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. That kind of sounds okay. I mean, sometimes you gotta work with what you have, but what about this front part? We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. Do you realize that's borrowed directly from Marxism? That's right. And the reason why is because if you support the nuclear family of a man, woman, and children, the man is the bishwazi, the woman is subverted, and you can't have that in a Marxist society. I don't like this piece of fruit. Don't like it at all. This was in the charter of the Black Lives Matter up until September 2020 when it was discovered and published and then immediately taken down. It had been up there for four years. But because it brought so much heat, it came right out and says we are a Marxist movement and it's set and they cleaned it up and I went to go check it and see what's on there and I couldn't even get on the site last night. I don't know why. Six months later, Patrice left the organization, largely due because the gig was up. The one at the top and Marxism and the humanism that follows. Jesus said, Jesus said, we will know them by their fruit. There are many sinister rulers, people in power, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places going on in this world. And we just got another form of humanism. The church is always going to deal with it. We always had humanism, but today it's fully weaponized with Marxism. The Christians in Revelation derived great comfort knowing, knowing that in the end, God was on the throne and Jesus Christ was in control. Revelation 4 and 5. So what do we do with this? Consider these scriptures in light of Satan's toolbox. Colossians 2.8. See to it no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Our obligation is to Christ. If there are movements out there that have become anti-theistic Marxist, if you're banned from even taking the gospel, you have three choices, become like them, or convert them, become like them, or leave them alone. That's the only choices you have. And if they refuse to hear anything about God and they ban you from that, why would you want anything to do with that at all? God's always making new people. Imagine, imagine if the people who were instrumental in leading your newest brother Hayden to Christ just a few weeks ago. Imagine if that time was spent trying to turn over, instead of stones, pyramids. We'd still be out there lifting and not going anywhere. There are a billion Haydens out there in the world and we need to be reaching out to them. Here's another verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Examine everything carefully. 
carefully, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. That's why I told you and why Paul said it's up at the top because the low-hanging fruit that we have for evangelism, it's there. Don't waste all your time up here. Understand it. But you're not going to convince anybody at the top while a hundred people go to hell because we wasted that time. Third verse, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Think on these three verses and you will have comfort. And you will see clearly. But we know from the scriptures this should take nobody by surprise.